Hello, my name is Dr. Ahmed Adlan, and I'm a senior cardiology fellow at Wigginshaw Hospital in Manchester. And I prepared a short talk uh, to cover the cardiovascular examination. I've got no disclosures and, or any conflicts of interest. So the main uh, objective of the talk really is to provide a practical approach to clinical examination and in particular cardiovascular assessment. Uh, secondly, um, this is really OSCE preparation, but it can be relevant for PACES and for just clinical practice. And I really hope that I can help to reduce your stress and improve your performance in the OSCEs. Uh, today's talk really is based upon some of my own personal experiences and things that I've been uh, taught over the years and uh, what I use in my own clinical practice. So just a few general principles, really. Uh, it's very important to always be very nice to the patients. Make sure you introduce yourself in a suitable fashion and uh, obtain consent. Now, um, do you, should you talk or should you not talk through the signs as you're examining the patient? Well, to be honest, there's no right or wrong answer. Personally, I prefer to talk through the positives and the relevant negatives. So it's a bit of a balance. I think it's very important to try to come up with a diagnosis before you actually auscultate the chest. And really, uh, auscultation should be just a confirmation of what you're expecting to hear. And that's something, uh, an important theme for, uh, to, for my uh, talk and the way I, I, I undergo and tackle cardiovascular examinations in general. Your main task, remember, is to pick up the clinical signs that are there. So really do focus on that aspect. And if you're, if you're a third year medical student, well, to be honest with you, you just need to go through the motions and demonstrate that you're competent at doing a clinical examination. But for final years, and also for clinical practice and paces, you really must focus on picking up clinical signs. So to begin with, inspection. Now, uh, I would say force yourself to stop and, and actually take a step back. Um, I would actually step, take one further step back from where this uh, current uh, doctor is examining the patient. Um, I would expose the patient sufficiently and look at the patient in general. You can get a lot of clues. I actually like to start by looking at the legs first uh, and I look at the soles of the feet to look for any signs of ulcers or amputations and already I'm thinking maybe this patient's got a diabetic foot, there might be signs of peripheral vascular disease. I would look at the toes and the toenails, you can see splinter hemorrhages on the toenail. Um, you can look for, as I said, signs of amputations to suggest peripheral vascular disease. Uh, also, you can look for scars. So it's very important to look for scars for, from previous surgery. So uh, patients who've had uh, bypass grafts, which might come up in the exams, uh, have a look to see if you can see signs of scars for saphenous vein grafts. And, and obviously, you'd also be able to look for signs of uh, edema as well, which is very important in the cardiovascular examination. And when you're examining for a peripheral edema, be careful not to press too hard hard when you're trying to demonstrate pitting edema um, that doesn't go down well with the examiners and the patients. Remember to quantify the peripheral edema present. So at what level? Is it just at the ankles? Is it, toward, is it at the level of the shin, below the knee, above the knee, mid thigh, top thigh, or even within the sacrum? And uh, that gives you an idea of the degree of cardiac decompensation. Then uh, I would look at the hands. Now, I would say be very careful not to cause any harm to the patients when you're checking their palms or, and their dorsum. So I actually uh, ask the patient to, to spread their hands out and uh, I ask them to uh, rotate their hand 
Um, and I also ask if, if they have any uh, pain. Um, whenever you need to move a patient, always check to make sure they haven't got any pain. Uh, then I look at the, fi uh, the fingers and I lo I'm looking for, for finger prick marks um, from when people have been checking their BMs and that might suggest the patient has diabetes. Uh, and, I, and, I, and again, I ask if the patient has any pain before moving them. And this is very important, especially when checking for a collapsing pulse. Now I've, I've shown here uh, five examples of hand signs. Uh, you can have a look at those and, and I'm sure you will get them all. Uh, sometimes the signs are not as, as uh, clear cut as this, uh, but there will be the answers at the end. Then I move on to the pulse. And this is quite important. So in my mind, I want to know, is the, does the patient have a regular pulse or does the patient have an irregular pulse? Now, if the patient has a regular pulse, then it's most likely sinus rhythm. But if it's irregular, then I I'd want to know, is it irregularly irregular? In, in other words, there's no pattern to it, in which case this is most likely atrial fibrillation. Or is it quite regularly irregular? And it's difficult to describe that unless you actually um, find a patient who has e ectopy, uh, because what you'll find with e frequent ectopics is that there is a period of regularity and then there is an irregular, there's something like an irregular beat. Um, and that can happen, uh, for example, in patients with bigeminy or trigeminy. Remember, sinus arrhythmia is also, can also be uh, irregular, but they're very slight fluctuations and they tend to occur with breathing. Now, if the pulse rate is dead on 60 and regular, for me, that, that's suspicious for a pacemaker. So just bear that in mind. And I would measure out the pulse rate. Um, AF tends to be a little bit faster, uh, around 80 beats per minute. Um, Without, without a pacemaker. Look out for medical alert bracelets. So actually while you're checking the pulse, do have a look and read them. Uh, do not be afraid to read any, uh, any bracelets or necklaces. Now, the, another reason why I, uh, I like to spend a bit of time on the pulse is that I actually listen out for any mechanical heart sounds or mechanical clicks during the pulse check. And that can, that can all, you know, instantly give you a clue that you're dealing with a mechanical valve. And that takes a bit of pressure off, uh, pressure off you. So you won't be surprised when you come to listen to the heart sound. Then um, I actually would look for radial to radial delay and also radial femoral delay. Uh, at this point, I would actually ask for a blood pressure. And when you ask for a blood pressure, actually listen out to what the blood pressure is. Um, if the blood pressure is, demonstrates a wide pulse pressure, then that's suggestive of aortic regurgitation. And that will tell you now you need to look for signs of aortic regurgitation in the rest of the examination. If the pulse pressure is narrow, uh, and if the, the um, blood pressure is high, then that uh, can often be the case. Uh, can often be the case in patients with aortic stenosis. If the blood pressure is on the lower side, then that usually suggests the patient has severely reduced LV function, and you may find signs of mitral regurgitation and a displaced apex on the clinical examination. And the reasons for this, and there are many reasons, and, and some of them are related to the medications as well that patients are on with uh, heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. So then I would actually palpate the carotid pulse or the, or the supraclavicular um, re, uh, pulse because you can't reassess character on, uh, on, um, uh, on a, on a radial pulse, so it's very important. Um, on the top left and the middle uh, uh, pictures, they show the right way to assess for the carotid artery um, pulse. 
and on the right hand side is incorrect and this is something that i i picked up when i was um doing my my uh, uh oskies is that on on the right hand side that you know it, 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 it's almost like you're strangling the patient in a way um so always make sure that you put your hands on the uh, on the uh the, the lateral side of the patient don't cross over uh, and when you're listening when you're feeling the character of the pulse really i'm what i'm interested in is this does this patient have a slow rising pulse and that may point towards the aortic stenosis uh now actually before checking the clotted pulse i would actually check for a collapsing pulse um and uh this is a sign of, of aortic regurgitation severe aortic regurgitation so the way that i would do this actually is i would uh, i think this this diagram demonstrates it very very well um, so you 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 have the patient um you you, you feel for the um so you put your, the palm of your hand over the where the the, the, the radial pulses of the patient and you, you check with them to make sure that they don't have any pain uh, and warn them that you're going to lift lift their arm up and then you raise the hand into this uh, the arm into this position and your left hand really is is just uh, apl applying some support but where you, what you're actually feeling for the collap collapsing pulse is your right hand and it's actually the your uh, sort of first and second uh, fingers are what 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 you will actually feel the collapsing nature of the pulse and what do you mean by collapsing well you can see at the top of the cartoon that in a normal pulse you get this sort of uh, rise in systole and then you have this diastolic notch so what happens is the diastolic pressure doesn't fall too low so it's slightly maintained but with severe aortic regurgitation uh, you 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 don't get that you you lose that diastolic uh, notching and the diastolic pressure falls very low and that's why you get a wide pulse pressure um so you can actually see that uh here this is the systole and this is the diastole this is systole and this is diastole in normal, normal cases so this, this is a very wide pulse pressure and this is what you're feeling uh when we talk about collapsing pulse okay next jvp so the JVP, I would say in an exam situation, keep things very simple. Make a point to position the patient in, in the correct uh, position, so 45 degrees, and ask, and I would ask them to look up and point, actually point to the ceiling towards their left, um, to, you know, just to make things easy. Then you need to uh, look out for the, uh, the landmarks here. So you've got uh, this uh, yeah, so you've got the uh, clavicular head here. You've got the sternal head of the um, um which is this, this, this. These are the landmarks, and this is where you're going to be looking for the JVP. Um, on the diagram here on the bottom, you can see this green thing is called the jugular meter. And if, if only we had this in the exam, but we don't. But this is essentially what you're measuring: this vertical height uh, from the chest at the level of the uh, where you see the pulsation, the JVP, and that is the height there. So that's what you're looking for. Now, is really an exam situation. You want to know is the JVP visible or not? Um, if it is visible, does it appear normal or is it uh, elevated? If if it's not uh, visible, then I would actually uh, check a bit higher up because sometimes actually the JVP can actually be very markedly raised and actually just below the earlobe or at the level of the earlobe in, in patients who are very congested. It's, like, it's unlikely that you get that in the exam. Um, the, the other thing I would do is the hepatojugular reflex um, and that is where you apply pressure in the abdomen uh, and that what that does is in, it, it, it enhances venous return to the right side of the heart and will accentuate the JVP. Uh, it's just useful to, to just do that maneuver just to demonstrate that you, you that you know that you know it and if you if you uh, usually if you do that you can actually see the JVP. Now bear in mind that a prominent JVP can be due to many things. Uh, it can be due to decompensated heart failure, it can be due to right-sided heart failure, 
uh, due to decompensated uh, congestive cardiac failure, could be due to significant tricuspid regurgitation, also complete heart block, um, and cardiac tamponade, both of which are highly unlikely in an exam situation. Now, at this point, uh, you should be getting a picture and of working out what the likely diagnosis uh, will be. So you you know you you've done your inspection, uh, and at this point you've got your pulse and your and your, and your, and your blood pressure, etc. Um, so what you're left with now is a, a careful examination of the chest and auscultation of the heart sound. So you should, by this point, you can see that that you're getting the clues. You can sort of figure out what the diagnosis is going to be. So really, uh, exam inspection of the chest is very important to look for signs of uh, previous cardiac surgery uh, and also uh, devices. So do take some time to have a look at this diagram be a, and, and, and in real life be able to look and interrogate the patient to see if you can find any of these things. Same thing with pacemakers. The pacemakers can be on the left side of, they can be on the right side, um, they can be up towards the clavicle or more towards the delta pectoral groove. Um, sometimes you've got to, you can get these subcutaneous ICDs uh, on the lateral uh, in the axilla uh, on the left hand side. Uh, so do take a bit of time to actually have a look and palpate um, as well. Uh, so if you if you've got if you find that a patient has had a has got a, a stenotomy scar or a, any other uh, surgical scar, you know, remember, remember that patients may have isolated. Uh, they may have an isolated valve surgery, or they may have an isolated CABG, or uh, they may have a combined valve and CABG surgery. So bear that in mind. Um, it's less common in in a, in a uh, exam situation for you to, to have a patient um, who's had congenital heart disease, but it is, it is possible uh, they may have had a VSD repair or an ASD repair. And as I mentioned about pacemakers, so uh, remember ICDs and CRTDs are, are very large. So the, the pulse generator, the box or the can, very large. And I mentioned about the subcutaneous ICD. Okay, uh, moving on to the apex. Okay. Assessment of the apex is, is also uh, very important. Um, and you have to demonstrate that you know how how to find the apex. So go through the motions of, as demonstrated in the picture. Um, now the apex may well be displaced and you may find it quite soft. And uh, that may often indicates that the patient has got, may, may well have uh, mitral regurgitation um, and they, they may have dilated cardiopathy, they may have L, an a, LV dilatation. So with that, you often get a mitral regurgitation murmur. So if the apex is in its usual position and it feels quite strong to you, then you can think about aortic, aortic stenosis may well be the, the, the case. Um, the other possibilities are, could be uh, um, that they have, the patient may have hypertrophic cardiopathy uh, or hypertension with LVH. Um, and hypertrophic cardiopathy tends to be younger patients, hypertension more older, um, usually it's, I would say it's women who have this type of pattern, um, and, uh, they may well have an LVOT obstructive murmur, which sounds very much like aortic stenosis. So what if you can't feel the apex? Okay. Don't panic. That does happen sometimes. It may well in, may well be that the apex is displaced and you've just got to feel a bit further out, you know, further out into the axilla. The patient may have a lot of adipose or they may have a lot of lung in the way, so COPD. The other thing with COPD patients is that they, because of the hyperinflated uh, chest, often it, the whole heart is sort of pushed down. Similarly, if you've got a patient who's very tall and thin, uh, they, they also the same, you, you get the same sort of thing with it with the heart uh, elongating and sometimes the apex is actually a lot lower down. Um, or you may find that actually uh, the patient may have 
advectopy or they have atrial fibrillation. So some of the beats uh, are, are, are quite soft and you may not feel them. So don't, do take a few, you know, good five, 10 seconds of actually palpating in that spot, um, just in case patient has ectopy or AF. Uh, okay, next, moving on to the valve assessment. And I think this is, this is often can be quite tricky. Um, and uh, I was taught a sort of, sort of a simplified approach, which I will share with you today. So um, the important thing to remember about valves and, and heart sounds is that uh, the valves make a sound when they close. So not when they open, when they close. Now, if they don't open very well, like in aortic stenosis, then well, they don't make a they don't make much of a sound when they close. Okay, so just bear that in mind. And the way that uh, the sequence that I use is I start off in the mitral area, then the tricuspid area, and the pulmonary area, and the aortic area. So I listen M M T P A, and I listen with the diaphragm and also with the bell. Um, now the diaphragm actually, I'm actually listening, listening out for systolic murmurs. Okay, so I'm listening for mitral regurgitation, loudest in the mitral area, tricuspid regurgitation, loudest in the tricuspid area. You can see where I'm going here. Pulmonary stenosis, um, loudest in the pulmonary area, and aortic stenosis, loudest in the aortic area. Uh, then once I've listened to them, I will also listen. I would switch over and listen to with the bell. But actually, the bell um, is really mainly for diastolic murmurs. And there are only really, I would say, two important diastolic murmurs to be aware of in an exam situation. And uh, these are mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation. For uh, mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation, remember to position the patients correctly. So mitral stenosis, you have to get the patient in the left lateral position, get them to breathe in and out, and then ask them to hold. We call this end expiration. Uh, and again, you listen in the mitral area and, um, you, and you listen, I'll talk about the murmur uh, later on. The autoregurgitation, uh, actually, it's in the left sternal area with the patient leaning forward. And again, it's uh, with end expiration. Right, now let's go to the specific uh, murmurs one by one. So as I mentioned, this is the order that I examine in. So it's not necessarily the order that uh, the likelihood of what you're gonna get in the exam. So the first uh, place I listen out for in the mitral area using the diaphragm, uh, I listen for systolic murmur of mitral regurgitation. And it's a pan systolic murmur and it's loudest in the mitral area radiating to the axilla. So bear that in mind. So you have to listen to the axilla. Um, it's louder on expiration. Okay, very important to remember this that the 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 valve uh, the, the the murmurs will vary depending on inspiration or expiration. So MR is louder on expiration. Um, they're usually associated with, as I mentioned before, with uh, a displaced apex and a lower blood pressure. So do remember that from uh, early on in examination. If, uh, the louder the murmur, usually the more severe the degree of regurgitation is. Okay, then I listen to the uh, tricuspid area for tricuspid regurgitation. And again, similarly, it's a pan-systolic murmur. This time it's usually louder than the tricuspid area and it doesn't usually radiate to the axilla. Um, it's actually louder with inspiration, okay? Because what, during inspiration, there's increased return to the right heart. So the right heart, uh, the murmurs coming from the right heart are accentuated by inspiration. M murmurs of the left side of the heart are uh, accentuated by expiration. And tricuspid regurgitation is almost always associated with a raised JPP. Now, the, the, the difficulty with tricuspid regurgitation is that it can be present with or without mitral regurgitation. So that's something to bear in mind. 
that you may actually have both. And sometimes one or the other may be more severe. So it may be that the TR is more severe than the MR or the MR is more severe than the TR. So um, bear that in mind. Sim similarly, uh, you know, you may or may not have a displaced apex. So if the patient has a significant MR that's causing TR, then you may actually get uh, a displaced apex and all of those other things associated with, with mitral regurgitation. Now, if the second heart sound is very loud, that's often a sign of pulmonary hypertension. You just have to remember that. Um, and think about TR in those situations. Okay, then I listen to the pulmonary area uh, for pulmonary stenosis. And to be honest with you, you do that, but actually I would forget about it in the exam situation. Uh, if, you, if you do get such a case, it's usually an, uh, an adult congenital heart disease patient who's may, who've had, had uh, cardiac surgery um, and may have some residual pulmonary stenosis. But uh, that's a very complex case. Um, now, the, the next place to, to listen out for is the aortic area. And this is probably the most common murmur you'll get, which is aortic stenosis. And actually, usually it's actually straightforward to hear the, the, the systolic murmur. It's an ejection systolic murmur. Uh, but sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between mitral regurgitation because um, uh, they're both. So if you've got severe mitral regurgitation, it can be extremely loud. And you may, you may think that it's actually aortic stenosis. But uh, aortic stenosis is loudest in the aortic area and you, you will get um, radiation to the carotid. You should look out for the sec an absence of the second heart sound because this is, would suggest severe aortic stenosis. And remember, you may find earlier on that you had a slow rising pulse. And if you've got those, those features, if you've got a slow rising pulse, then you're already thinking along the lines of severe aortic stenosis. And before narrow pulse pressure, slow rising pulse, um, think of severe aortic stenosis. So when you examine, listen to the second heart sound and see whether the second heart sound is absent or not. Um, if the second heart sound is audible, then it's not severe. It could be moderate, it could be mild, but it's not severe. Uh, the, other, the other trick with the aortic stenosis is, is that the loudness of the murmur is not always related to the severity. You can have a very severe aortic stenosis, which is really barely audible. Um, where, and conversely, you can have the loudest ejection systolic murmur, but actually it's only mild aortic stenosis. Uh, now, what if you get a situation where you've got an ejection systolic murmur that's louder from the aortic area, but it's not radiating to the carotid? In that situation, think of aortic sclerosis. The other thing to bear in mind with an aortic stenosis murmur is that it can also mimic LVOT obstruction or left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And I've mentioned this before, patients um, may have hypertrophic cardiopathy or hypertension and the HCM patients tend to be younger and hypertensive patients in, tend to be older and in, tend to be um, uh, women, I would say. Okay, now I've listened in those areas with the diaphragm for the systolic murmurs. Next, I'll listen with the diaphragm, uh, sorry, with the bell uh, for the diastolic murmurs. So the first one I would listen out for is the mitral stenosis. Now, it's, it can be difficult to pick up. So just do your best and get, try to get the patient in the right position to give you the best chance. And that's in the left lateral position at the end of expiration with your um, stethoscope on the, uh, in the mitral position. And what you're listening out for is a mid-diastolic murmur. Um, it, can, it can be tricky because um, Usually, the patient will be in atri will have atrial fibrillation. So you would have picked up already, hopefully, that the patient has atrial fibrillation, and you can pick that up when you listen to the heart sounds as well as uh, the pulse. Uh, and then I listen with the bell uh, in the uh, um, now what I, for the for aortic regurgitation. Okay, 
Now, you've already may have this in mind if the pulse pressure is wide, the patient may already have, uh, may have signs of a collapsing pulse. And again, that's suggestive of severe aortic regurgitation. In these, in these uh, patients uh, with aortic regurgitation, the apex is not usually displaced. So LV dilatation is a late sign and it's a very severe sign that the patient needs imminent surgery. Uh, so normally we would, um, you would intervene um, before the uh, left ventricle is, has enlarged too much. Uh, so, the, so again, the position is leaning forward with end expiration and a listen to the, in the left sternal edge. Okay. Now, when you've got, if you've got a case of aortic regurgitation, um, there are other uh, signs and there's multiple signs for aortic regurgitation. It's worthwhile knowing these and sometimes you can go back if you didn't pick them up the first time. Uh, I, I wouldn't suggest uh, routinely looking for them in every single patient, um, but if you do pick up aortic regurgitation, it's worthwhile going back and just double checking. So Queen Keys, um, which is the capillary uh, nail bed uh, pulsation, Corrigan's sign, which is the yellow uh, demusset sign, which is the bobbing of the head, uh, and Derosier's sign, which is the uh, which is is the characteristic, characteristic um, uh, when you auscultate the femoral uh, artery, you can hear of these pistol shot uh, um, breathe. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, that's the kind of the the the, the native valve assessment really. Um, now I'm just going to talk a little bit about prosthetic heart valves because sometimes in the exams you will, you will get patients who've got prosthetic heart valves. Uh, of these, the most common are aortic uh, or mitral valve. Sometimes they can you can have a combined uh, valve uh, operation, so you can have a uh, double valve, they call it, or sometimes you can have um, a replacement and a repair, so, you know, aortic valve replacement with a mitral valve repair, with or without a tricuspid valve repair, etc. Now, the important thing to note about prosthetic heart, uh, bioprosthetic heart valves, okay, so they can get bioprosthetic and you can have a mechanical heart, heart valves. The bioprosthetic valves, actually, you can't usually hear them when they close, okay? So you don't usually hear the valves closing. But with mechanical valves, you should do if they're working and functioning well. So what you will hear is a click. Now this click I've mentioned already, when you actually uh, felt for the pulse originally, you would have heard the click. And, you, and what I would recommend is to try to time the click with the heart sounds in the pulse. So if you've got a mechanical first heart sound, then you're talking about a mechanical mitral valve. And if it's a mechanical, if the second heart sound is uh, mechanical or metallic, then that's um, uh, aortic, okay? So, uh, so that's a typo, I should say metallic uh, second heart sound or metallic first heart sound, okay? The other thing to, to bear in mind is that a normal functioning prosthetic valve will have uh, what we call a flow murmur, okay? So if you have an aortic uh, prosthetic valve, expect normally to have a systolic flow murmur, okay? Um, and similarly, if you've got a mitral uh, prosthetic valve, you expect a, a diastolic flow murmur. Now flow murmurs, they are usually quite benign and um, you can get flow murmurs in, in, in normal, pa normal patients without any valve disease. And that usually indicates a hyperdynamic circulation, um, but, it's, but it occurs in functioning in normal functioning prosthetic valves as the blood flows through this prosthesis. So it's when the prosthesis or the prosthetic valve is open, that's when you'll hear that uh, flow murmur. Now, an abnormal functioning valve, um, can, it, it may well be that if you've got a, you know, an absence of a mechanical click, um, can be a sign that the valve is not working, but that's unusual in the exam situation. Uh, but it may be that you can get 
uh, patients who have regurgitant or obstructive prosthetic valves. So what that means is that the valves can degenerate over time and they become regurgitant. So actually you'll get the same uh, clinical features as, as a patient who's got uh, a regurgitant murmur. So for example, if they've got a prosthetic aortic valve, you'll pick up signs of aortic regurgitation. Or if they've got a prosthetic mitral valve, you'll hear uh, and you'll pick up signs of uh, mitral regurgitation. And similarly, if the patient has an obstructed, uh, obstructive valve, which can happen, um, you will get your, so they've got an obstructive prosthetic aortic valve, you will hear and you'll pick up signs for aortic stenosis and, uh, and the same for, um, for an obstructive mitral prosthetic valve, you'll, you'll pick up signs for mitral stenosis. So just to try and uh, keep things simple there. Uh, now, it can be tricky. Um, so my approach really with the heart valves, you, this is something you really do have to just sit down and get it clear in your head. So do take five, 10, 15, 20 minutes to just sit down and work this out in your head. And um, the, f the first thing I actually look for um, is, uh, is, is I, I feel the pulse, okay? So I feel the pulse. Now I'm just gonna just take a step back here. So on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the S1, when the valve closes. So the mitral and tricuspid valves close at S1, and then you get systole, and that's when you feel the pulse. That's when the pulse is palpable. Then when the, um, then when the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve close, that gives you S2, and then you get diastole, or diastolic phase, and then it re repeats, okay? So what I, my, my approach is firstly uh, feel the pulse and then try to work out which is S1 and which is S2. Once I've figured out um, which, which is, well, first of all, I, try, I then try to work out, can you actually hear the S1 and S2? Is it, are they audible or are they uh, quiet? So if you've got a quiet second heart sound, think about severe aortic stenosis. If uh, the, the uh, second heart sound is very loud, then think of pulmonary hypertension. Okay. Can you hear a, a gallop, gallop rhythm? And if you don't know what a gallop rhythm sounds like, I would recommend just having a listen to YouTube to have a listen to that. Uh, and that's, but that's usually characteristic of heart failure or acute heart failure, and that's quite unlikely in an exam situation. Then I focus on asking myself, can I hear anything in between the first and the second heart sound? And uh, this is the sort of looking for systolic murmurs essentially. And I mentioned already how I would use the diaphragm and go in sequence, M, T, P, A in those areas. And again, I've written there the systolic murmurs. Uh, if it's a pan-systolic murmur, okay, We've got a pan-systolic murmur now, not an non-rejection systolic murmur, pan-systolic murmur, uh, then I actually try to compare inspiration with expiration. And normally patients will do, you know, breathe in and out naturally. Uh, and so you don't usually have to tell them, but sometimes you, you do. And then I also look to, to see whether it radiates to the axilla. So that helps me distinguish between uh, mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation. And if it's an ejection systolic murmur, then I carefully listen out for the second heart sound. Is it quiet? Is it present? Is it absent? Um, and if it's, if it's absent, then it indicates severe aortic stenosis. And if it's quiet, it indicates significant aortic stenosis, probably moderate. Um, and I also then would think about checking the radiation to the carotids and bear that in mind. Um, then I would listen uh, with the bell in end expiration for uh, mitral stenosis, as I've mentioned, and aortic rotation. Okay. So uh, after, after auscultating uh, the heart sound, 
Um, my personal approach is at the end of the examination, I would actually percuss and auscultate the back of the chest and not just listen to the lung bases. And you may ask, well, why? Why do you do that? Well, actually, the official answer I would give an examiner is that I, I want to you know, be thorough and check for pleural effusions. But the real answer is that it gives me more time to put the signs together and to then interpret my findings and think about how I'm going to present uh, the findings and put it all together. Now, when, once I've done that, you know, if I've, if I've forgotten something, now is my, my chance to recheck. So do take the opportunity to, uh, to go back and, and recheck things if you've forgotten uh, something or you want to clarify a particular sign. Remember to thank the patient uh, at the end and always remember to cover them up. Okay, so now you've you've done the examination and now you, you are faced with the uh, examiner and you have to present your findings. So what I would say is when you're presenting the case and the findings, try to keep it simple. Don't try to disclose every aspect of the clinical examination. Mention something in general. So something that in general examination was the patient comfortable at rest or they breathless at rest. Um, you want to give an idea of whether the patient is compensated or decompensated. Okay, so if you're suggesting this patient has a cardiac condition, you want to know are they in a state of, de of decompensated heart failure? Okay, so if you see signs of, and you can say that, you can say there are signs of decompensation. Uh, as evidenced by peripheral edema, raised JVP, and by bilateral fluid effusions or, or uh, crackles in the chest. I would stick to the relevant positives uh, and the important negatives. Okay. Now, for any uh, valve lesion, uh, I would I would describe the diagnosis and say um, this patient has a clinical signs suggestive of mitral regurgitation. And you can say as evidenced by, you know, pansystolic murmur, uh, loudest in the mitral area, radiating to, radiating to the axilla. Remember to give an idea of the severity, uh, whether you think that, the, uh, that there are any markers of, sever of, severe, uh, of a severe lesion or you, if you're confident, you may say that there, you know, there, there aren't any features to suggest it's severe. And again, I've mentioned about decompensated and uh, compensated heart failure. Uh, now, you remember that if you've got a patient who has severe valve lesion, uh, or they have evidence of decompensated heart failure, then that's usually an indication that an intervention is required. And then finally, I would say to complete my examination, uh, take a thorough history, perform a full clinical examination, including peripheral pulses and fendoscopy, obtain a 12 lead ECG and an echocardiogram. Uh, and echocardiogram is to look, uh, look at the left ventricular systolic function and to confirm the presence of any valve disease, et cetera, or any structural heart disease. Uh, also, some bedside tests that you'd like to perform, and obviously the routine investigations and specialist investigations and uh, referrals. So, do not, you know, do do remember you can say that you'd ask, you'd refer the patient for a cardiology review. Okay, so uh, here are the uh, answers to the the quiz, and I think you probably would have got them. I don't think you'll get clubbing like that in the exam, if only, that would be fantastic. Um, this, this is an example of a splinter hemorrhage. These are the uh, finger prick marks from uh, BM testing that I mentioned before. Uh, this is an example of um, peripheral cyanosis. 
if the patient has central sinuses, okay, if the patient has central sinuses, then by definition, they will have uh, peripheral sinuses as well. And uh, here, uh, E are uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so I'd just like to say thank you for your time and uh, I wish you the very best in your examinations.